Mark Davis from the circle. And we are really glad to have him here. I mean, he's, he's really busy, but he spent, he, he chose, he chose to spend time with us today. And uh, please give us a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, is this a is this a software congress developers event? Are you all software developers? Okay, so I've been invited to talk about agriculture. So you have to indulge me at a, a second, but Alex knows what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're applying technology in the space of agriculture and why I'm sort of suggesting that agriculture is a huge opportunity that you should all be looking at, and that ESOCO is a sort of example, not only of what Ghana is possible. Uh, capable of building what a great team that we have, but also what I think is really an amazing opportunity that uh, is often overlooked. Just to put some context, there are four drivers, in my opinion, that have sort of put agriculture back on the top of the global agenda. Uh, when we started ESOC about seven years ago, um, I think really it was uh, more of a sort of social impact business to try and help smallholders uh, raise more money just so that they're better informed in terms of negotiating prices. Um, but I think that, uh, I'll be standing in the way of this. Okay, so one of the factors that I think is driven uh, is world population growth. Massive population that is estimated over the next uh, 30, 40 years. The other thing is the uh, increase in consumption of meat in China, as these countries get wealthier, they spend more money on meat. Meat drives, uh, needs a lot more sort of production of uh, animal feeds and so forth. That's driven the demand for food supplies, put pressure on it. I don't know what's happening to my presentation. Um, and then climate volatility. Uh, it's been harder for people to grow things because they don't know what's happening in terms of the weather. That's created a great deal of exposure. So all of this And where is that population growth happening? Africa. Where is most of the arable land available in terms of meeting that demand on the, on the food supply? It's in Africa. So what's happening? These guys are getting together and they're putting a whole load of money into it. I don't know if, you're, if you are building software and you need to get it funded, but there is a constant stream of $10 million deals that are, that are sort of being announced by USAID in northern Ghana. There is the ATT project that USAID has just funded, which is the advance of the agricultural technology transfer that is about how do you use technology in value chains in terms of developing agriculture. Africa is about 10% lower than where it was in 1960, and it's about producing about 25% of what it's capable of producing in terms of food. So altogether, there is a huge opportunity and huge pressure to feed the world, and everybody's looking at Africa. Most of the African agriculture context is about smallholders. About 90% of the agriculture in Ghana is smallholders. And there are probably about four ways in which you can intervene with smallholders to drive how they're increasing their production. You can provide them with loans, you can provide them with inputs, you can help them with storage around warehouses and roads. But from our perspective, you can empower them with information. That's what ESOP was trying to do. And from our perspective, over the last five years, mobile has changed everything. So what are the kind of technologies that are emerging in agriculture that you should know about? Who's heard of Frontline? You all heard of Frontline, right? Very successful, very simple. You plug a, a phone into a laptop, and you can push out SMS messages. They just announced 100,000 downloads, um, and it's really been one of the most successful, simple ways in which you can push out SMS messages to people. Teleribit, who's heard of Teleribit? This is a, a project out of Tanzania. This is taking it a little bit more sophisticated. It's hosted in the cloud. You can do some more sophisticated, um, sort of what happens if somebody texts something in. You can create paths and responses and so forth. Alex, I'm sure you're familiar with Teleribit. <clears throat> so, you find a project like CocoLink, uh, which is developed in Ghana by, uh, I think, is Derry Dean still doing it? 
Um, and this is about just putting out text messages to farmers within the Cocoa Valley chain uh, that's been quite successful. And they just announced a massive scale up of this in Cote d'Ivoire with the World Cocoa Foundation. Ramin Foundation is also uh, using Android phones with something called the Community Knowledge Work in Uganda. And this is where they basically have got um, agents who are trained who navigate through a search, create an answer, and they get paid for every question and every answer that they provide. Tata in India is building a rural service delivery platform. Again, this is focused on agricultural advice. It's sending out market prices, it's sending out weather alerts, um, but it's also interactive in the sense that farmers can photograph crop diseases, send that into the system that can be analyzed by professionals. Reuters is also getting into the game. They've probably got the biggest service for smallholder farmers. They've got, a, they claim about a million smallholder farmers in India that they're providing market price information to. Nokia is also in the game, and they've created this application called Live Tools, which comes with every Nokia phone um, that they're shipping. Um, and that also provides, uh, it's updated over SMS, but it's an application that sits on the phone, and it presents the content in a sort of simple, uh, I mean, it's not simple for us to read that, but it's a simple format in terms of weather alerts, price alerts, and so forth. I think we're also recognizing that there's a move to voice. Um, in Kenya, they had the Ken Call Full Center where they were allowing people just to call in and ask a question. And I think sometimes we're always trying to solve simple problems with difficult and complex solutions. But in fact, if you can allow a farmer just to call in and speak to somebody in their local language, uh, that's uh, perhaps one of the most effective ways of doing it. Nobody's worked out how to make money out of this yet. So in fact, that Ken Call program was stopped in Kenya. And then here in Ghana, there's Voto Mobile. Is anybody here from Voto Mobile? Have you heard of it? OK, so they're packaging and sending out voice messages for sort of civic um, awareness. And they're also looking at agriculture and a whole bunch of other things. But you can just program it and send out. In fact, Isoko is using Voto Mobile to send out voice messages that we want to deliver to the farmers. What you're also seeing in agriculture is a move to sort of tracking. So as you can understand that uh, in terms of some of the problems that Europe has had in tracing the horse meat in their burgers and all this kind of stuff, tracing where food comes from and understanding its source and who's grown it is a requirement. It's not a luxury, it's a requirement. So if you're exporting food, you've got to be able to say where your food comes from. And so there's a whole new range of tools that are emerging. Geotraceability is one of them. This is also being pioneered in Ghana. Uh, with, with Amanjaro, um, and they're using it to track the movement of cocoa beans. So they have sort of RF tags, I think they're doing some tagging with some simple, uh, I don't know if this is, that's just a, a reader there, and then it's being plotted into the, into the system. So any serious agricultural business that is exporting needs a database of data that they're tracking. And I think there are very few solutions out there that really allow them to do this well. Another one is Farm Force. This has been set up by Syngenta, which is a big seed company. Um, this is, uh, they're based out of uh, Switzerland, uh, but they've been pioneering this in Kenya. Uh, and then there's an agricultural seed company, um, uh, rice company, sorry, in Ghana, that is going to be using this to track exactly where their smallholders are and what they do. So you can see they plot uh, which farmer is where, what fields they own, and then they track through the growing season every single activity that that farmer is involved in. When did you apply a chemical? Um, so that when they are going to export their goods, they can show this is exactly the database and the history and the transaction history of that particular farmer. And then who's heard of M Farms here in Ghana? Is anybody here from M Farms? Oh, no, I've heard. Okay, so M Farms, this is a range of applications that these guys have built. Um, this is also all done here in Ghana, and they've got different modules from farmer management, uh, farmer-based organizations, extension services. Um, it's a suite of tools that you can download and that you can use. So let's just focus a little bit and share what we've done at ESOCO and how the technology is being used for us. 
We have about four key um, alert services that we've developed. We have market prices, weather forecasts, bids and offers, and agricultural advice. And we generally, anybody that signs up can receive this. It can be personalized to where they are, what they want, where they trade. And we deliver those messages automatically for them. Could be on a daily basis, could be on a weekly basis. This is a woman called Sarah Malanda in Malawi. Uh, she got prices on Isoko. Uh, she couldn't quite believe that that was really the price that they could get. So she and a few of her neighbors uh, rented a pickup truck, <laughs> took her goods to the long way, um, and instead of getting the $27 that was being offered to her by the local trader, uh, she sold it for $130. So there are really significant benefits for people who, uh, where you can pro provide information and give them a choice, and they will go to a different market and make a different sale. There's also some other interesting consequences of the technology that we would never have imagined. This is a, a, a we had a workshop in Cape Coast, and all the farmers were asked to sort of give feedback. We put the feedback up, and about out of the sample group of 18 farmers, about eight of them said this: "We don't have problems in our marriage." Who can explain that to me? If you're getting market prices on your phone, why does that change your domestic harmony? <laughs> Uh, who can explain it? Uh, there's money coming in. Jerry? There's no romance without finance. <laughs> Actually, what happens is they come back from the market, the spouse comes back to the market and says, This is all I got for the produce that we were selling. And there's a fight because they don't believe you, you know, that you spent the money on beer or something else. So they just check the market prices and uh, they can confirm that in fact the price that you are bringing home is accurate. So uh, actually we hear this consistently. I was in Malawi two weeks ago and again they were saying the same thing. This is a, a, a project in, um, in Malawi and they're using Isoko. Um, this is the, the government extension office. I went there last week and I walked in and I saw these machines and I was like excited because my background is in terms of actual print. That's where I started. Um, and I thought, and they're printing posters like this, and they're sharing printed materials around Malawi. And we were having a meeting with them, and I was like, oh my god, we're going to have to explain what this SMS technology is all about. It's going to be one of those ministry meetings all over again, and they're not going to understand anything. Um, and I went up and I sat with them, and they just ran through a list of all the technical issues that they're facing with ESOP in the most sophisticated and powerful way you can imagine. They said, what if one project is profiling this person and the other person is profiling them? How do we share that? How do we resolve that uh, dilemma? And they were just racing ahead. They're taking about 18,000 farmers across Malawi that they're registering in the system. And they're sending out extension messages to farm leaders and extension officers about new seed varieties, what changes are happening within the agricultural space. So they were... Um, really impressive. They're also using Isoko in Malawi to track the distribution of fertilizer. They said that they wanted to try this as a pilot and in December and we said, wait a minute, Isoko is not designed for tracking stock or anything like that. We haven't built the stock module yet. Uh, we don't do inventory. And they said, no, we just want to, we want to experiment with it. We want to play with it. And so they created this pilot and they send out a message when a truck is sent out to the warehouse manager saying when did the truck arrive and how many bags of fertilizer are on it. Because what would happen before is the truck would take about three days, it would get diverted, a couple of bags of fertilizer would go missing, and so they were losing about a quarter of a million dollars a year. And now that they've installed Isoko, they get a text message back from the warehouse that afternoon saying these are the bags, this is the number of bags, this is the truck has arrived. And so it's created transparency within that business. And they've completely transformed the way they're distributing uh, and tracking leakage within the system. So you as developers can think about all these examples about how technology could be used for applied technology, for day-to-day -day, uh, challenges that are faced within the agricultural space. Land of Lakes is another NGO um, in Malawi, and they said they 
have radio programs advising farmers about how to grow things and what to do. They send out a text message to those farmers on Isoko in the beginning of the day advising them when the broadcast is going to happen. And then they send out a text message at the, after the broadcast reminding them of what the topics are within the broadcast. So it's a very interesting combination of radio and SMS. And this is a project also in Malawi where the government is sending out climate um, notices um, to farmers around the country using Isoko just to warn them about floods or special rains, when the rains are coming or when the rains aren't coming. So this theme about weather constantly crops up and many of the projects that we're looking for, all of the countries, are trying to help farmers work out when the rains are coming, when should they plant. I think maybe, uh, you know, if, if, you plant, if you use pesticide on your plants and then it rains, it's just washed away and it becomes useless. And that's really a waste of money. Um, so conversely, if you apply fertilizer, the soil must be moist. So you have to wait and you have to know that you apply that when the rains are coming. So agriculture is somewhat technical in that sense, and people need information to plan around them. So Isoko started with sort of basic price information and weather alerts and offers, but we've understood that the businesses within the agricultural value chain are trying to manage information. And so we've moved and we've started to build a bunch of applications. Um, one of them uh, is called Knowledge Plus, and this is where you can build your own content app on Android and give it to extension officers or field agents, and they can walk around with exactly the technical data that they need to share in the field. The problem with Ghana's extension department right now is if you ask an extension officer, and do you know what an extension officer is? Yes. If you ask what an extension officer, one thing over here, they'll give you one answer, and you ask them something else over here, it's a completely different answer. So how do you provide tools whereby people can have consistent information, up-to-date information? So we built this app. You can define the menu, you can upload the content, you can push it out over the app, and any one of your field agents can be walking around with a simple content application. It's kind of like a wiki on, on mobile. Um, we've got profiling apps like this. Again, if, if every business is trying to understand who their farmers are and where their product is being sourced from, they need to profile those farmers. And so there's a huge movement across Africa to actually digitize farmers. Everybody that is selling seeds or buying produce is trying to build a database of farmers, and that's a huge opportunity for you. You should build tools to help them to do that. Um, and it, just like the example from Malawi where they're using paper to track the fertilizers, um, people need to stop using paper. They need to be able to just enter something on a simple phone so that they can know what the inventory of the warehouse is. So there is huge opportunities. But at the same time, it's not just about technology. Um, we just launched a call center, or we'll be launching it publicly in October. So we've got about eight agents um, at the ESOPA building, and we're answering questions for farmers. Um, and we've realized that uh, even if you push out a simple SMS message to a farmer, sometimes they might not understand it, or they need some additional information. So they call in, and they say, you told me to use uh, to be uh, weeding, uh, which pesticide, where can I buy it? So these agents are able to provide that information, and we're speaking, what are the languages we've got in the call center? Dagari, Dagbani, Prafra? Treat well, I think we've got about 18 languages that we're covering in the, in the call center. Um, one of the other things that I think we realized is that you know technology just doesn't walk on its own legs. Um, it's really hard to get a product like this being used and um, being implemented. And it's all about relationships on the ground. So a lot of the work that we do is out in the field just training farmers in terms of how to use the basic functions of a mobile phone, how to get to your text messages, how to empty a, a message box that is full. Um, and most of the work that ESOFU is doing is actually training in the field. The other thing that we had to, that we realized very early on is that that market price information that we need that farmers are asking for doesn't exist. 
So we have 43 agents around Ghana that is collecting market prices every week. This photograph was taken yesterday. These are all the agents at Isoko. Um, and we have just transitioned them this week onto Android phones. So we gave them all one of these phones. Um, and uh, they will be entering their price information uh, through this uh, interface. So they're pretty excited and uh, I think uh, we're really proud that Ghana is one of the first that is shifting um, market enumerators onto digital, onto Android. And we've just been in Mozambique, we're training up the government there, but is also using the ESOCO system to go from paper to digital. So that's just a quick overview of some of the technologies that I think are coming in agriculture that are interesting. This is the ESOCO team, and I'm really proud that a whole bunch of you are here today. Um, and uh, you're all very welcome to come down and visit us in, uh, on Ring Road. Um, but I'd like to hand over to Stanley just to talk about a few points about the team and how we do some of the technology in ESOCO. And uh, Stanley Guache is one of our developers, and we'll explain about that. Um, Stanley, I'm just going to let you know some of the things we do technically, um, briefly, just by chance. So. Okay, so before I let you in on the various um, technologies we use on our platform, I think I would like to explain um, architecture, basically. Um, so we have a backend, which is our API, basically implementing the backend logic, the business logic, um, most of the functionalities um, of our platform. So on top of this backend actually sits the various clients. By clients I mean the mobile applications. Right now we have J2ME application, we also have um, the Android application. The web also sits on top of this API. So basically the API serves um, all these clients, data, the clients have the ability to request for manipulation of data in certain ways which will be used by them. Um, third parties, developers, can also use the API to access data, manipulate data, input data, and in essence, build their own application on top of the backend. So we use Java um, with GWT, um, Google Grid, for our web application, and then also Java for, of course, our J2ME applications and our Android application. Our server side is basically PHP. Um, that implements the core functionality. We use Python for our tests, automated um, test scripts. And Postgres is our DB for saving data in blobs. Our platform is basically Linux. Um, we use some shell scripting for tools. Nina already spoke about using the use of Golang. We use it for our various tools, benchmarking, we use it for weather and so on. We, we are based, we use Apache. And also, um, because we send out volumes of SMSs, um, we have our own kernel, which is an open source SMS gateway, basically. So it's built, compiled by us, it's open source, and we use it to distribute messages um, in cases when we have SFTP connections with um, the various providers. Um, we use Nitrous, it's not spelled right here, um, for system monitoring. And so on. We have other, a host of other um, applications we use for our platform. Now, our recipe for handling change. At the so there are a whole lot of requests that comes in. We, we change a lot. And from our research, we also have a lot of requests coming in, ideas for improving our services. Now, our product team actually brings everything, prioritizes everything for us, and then sends it to the engineering team. As engineering, we also do our own form of prioritization. But basically, um, for changes that we do, we implement change requests, um, we drink, have fun, we sleep, and definitely there are more requests. So, this will yeah. seem like it will go forever until Isoko is a finished product. Um, we've learned a couple of lessons um, as a business and also um, as a tech team. Now these are just some five points on what we've learned as a technical team, not as a business. 
FASA may actually apply. Prioritize. So we have, like I already said, we have a lot of change requests. Requests that mean a lot of things we need to do. But then we need to prioritize the things that are important for us as ISOPO, the things that we want to do, and the social services. So basically, we've learned that priority is very key to our progress. Okay, and we also think of our application more as um, a service than a web application. What, what we are saying is, um, you should be able to allow people to harness your service. So, Isoko started off by providing APIs for you where, like I already said, the third party, um, you as a developer can actually use our services. You can query data, you can manipulate data, use it in various ways. Mark made mention of Knowledge Plus, which is an example of a third party application that sits on um, the Isoko backend. Store for time. So, we provide we actually have, as a tech team, creative and risky ways of trying to solve issues for the short term so that we have enough time to solve the longer term issues. Sometimes it causes problems, but those are some of the things we've learned to do. Um, we also succeed as a team. So we have a cross-discipline team where um, there are various people with various skills. Lina is skilled in a host of other things, even though it's in the system. Team. So you need a team, and the team have to be functional, you have to work together to provide something that will be successful. And then forget about complexity. I mean, most of the time we try to solve issues that may never occur, or we try to solve tomorrow's issues whilst we leave today's issue. So it's good to actually, before looking, make provision to go on with um, your development, but you need to keep it simple, and we believe that premature complexity is the root of all evil. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, we have time for. Oh, so we have time for three questions. So just three questions. All right, questions. Two. Okay. So I noticed that in your stack, when you talked about your architecture, yeah. I saw somewhere at the bottom some version. You use that for version control? Yeah, we, use, we actually use SVN for version control. Okay. Is there any particular reason why you choose that over Git and GitHub? Um, for, for our purposes, right, we've not, we don't have a very large code base where we actually need to extend to use something like GitHub. So, for our purposes, SVN works for us, and um, so that's that's it. Any other question? To help, help people, what? Mine the data. Exactly. So that's that's what we speak about when we talk about providing APIs for your um, projects. So what we have is an API which can basically allow you. It's a web service, right? So it allows you to query for any amount of data based on certain agree agreements. So basically you can get any information from us as a developer and use it to actually build your own application, use it for various services to help that. So we, we, haven't, yeah. we haven't completely formalized this, but I think um, you know, a lot of the businesses in agriculture that I, that I showed, like geotraceability, um, the actual value is not tracking the product, but is building the database uh, of people. And I think that that's sort of one of the secrets in this, that whoever gets to some kind of scale and has a database, there are 90 million households um, in uh, farming households in Africa. And all of the businesses are trying to reach them, advertise to them, buy from them, or sell to them. So there are Effectively, I think millions of applications that can be used against that database. And I think that each of these applications, just like Isoka, if you look at its development, it started very small with market prices and it's been dragged into stock tracking, it's been dragged into uh, weather alerts, it's been dragged into traceability, trying to track things. And the question is, will one business be able to build all of those applications? We'd love to but I think it's going to be impossible. I think if you know any technology or any platform that tries to do everything, fails. So 
uh, how do we effectively create an environment where you as a developer could get access to all the tools, to all the interconnects with the operators, to all the payment platforms that we all have, so that you can build apps and we become your distribution uh, platform, giving you access to hundreds of thousands of people right away. John Deere Tractors called us about three weeks ago saying, you've got 30,000 farmers in your database that I'm interested in Ghana, I want to send a message to them. So we, we, you know, I think Alex, you must be familiar with all these kind of brand campaigns. It's like, fine, it typically costs about one cent to send a message in this country. You want that message to go to an advertiser and we'll get, sell you a, a, a demographic, we'll charge you 10 cents per message. So those sorts of ways in which we could expose the platform to you guys with this standard, and I'm not a tech guy, so I don't really know what I'm talking about, but, <laughs> you know, with, with the API and then just take advantage of all your developing skills is our vision to how we can take eSoco forwards. But I'm just not sure that we're ready to do that right today, are we? Because um, you, you own the API, right? <laughs> so, so if one of these developers came and said, listen, you guys, you're in Malawi, you're in Mozambique, you're in Zimbabwe, you're in Kenya, you've got a database of like 200,000, you're connected to all these mobile operators, you know, I've got an idea for an app, you know, could they, could they build something with us? Yeah, if one or two, but I mean, if all of them are enemies, we have to, we still have a lot of things to finalize, so I guess if we have a few coming in, we can actually use that as the learning process for um, setting you up. So, so I think if anybody has an idea that you're thinking about, or even if you want to compete with our apps, if you think I can build a better weather forecasting app on Isoko, or I could build a better price distribution app on Isoko, we would be interested in that because I think it's that kind of an environment that we're looking for. And in that sense, we think Isoko can get dumber and dumber and dumber and just be sort of like uh, the technology. Because what you don't really want to do is you don't want to have to build that call center you don't want to have, to have a team of people out in the field. You don't want to talk to the mobile operators. Has anybody negotiated a deal with the mobile operators? <laughs> exactly. Has anybody raised your hand if you've operated it. a deal? You know, it's like I just don't know whether these guys are friends or enemies. Alex, what is your opinion? Come on, SMSPA. Well, we might not be a very good case. Because you're in bed with them. <laughs> yeah, he, he's got a good deal with them. But I can tell you, if you're looking at mobile and you're developing technology and apps for folks today, which is where it's all at, Airtel's first answer when you walk in the door is going to be 70%. That's it. It's 70% right off the bat. That's the money that they're going to take out of your business. So you've got to have a really, really, really cheap business. So if it's Bible quotes, that's okay. The source is already there. Nobody's going to charge you for it. You can just package it up, program it, and send it out. But if you've got to create that content, like market prices, then it's a completely different deal. And that is a discussion that is going to play out over the next two or three years. And um, who knows? They could kill us in the, in the, in the process. All right, so the final question. Yeah. So, um, I think you were getting prices by uh, having agents in the team, right? And uh, this, you're doing this because crowdsourcing didn't really work. Uh, that's the reason you buy agents. So, I mean, did you explore crowdsourcing the prices for your market? No. It's hard enough to get the prices from our own agents that we pay on a monthly basis. Um, our mark, I mean, crowdsourcing, I'm sort of, I think it works great in theory, but in practice, I'm not sure. You've got to have a digitally enabled community that has an incentive to respond to a question that you send. So if we ask people, like, what's the price in your market, why would they tell us? Why would they bother? What are they going to get out of it? And how do we know that that price is accurate? So, I mean, in general, it's more accurate than more than if you can get people to send you in prices. I mean, if you can figure out I don't, why they would do it. How do you know what the difference is between this brand of Gary and another brand of Gary? Or, you know, any variation of the varieties of commodities? Because it's very hard to know what a standard is. Even okay. between MOFA that collects prices in Ghana and we, there are two completely different methodologies. I think the crowdsourcing model that works is the one that they're using that's defined within a project. So the question that they send out on the SMS saying how many bags of fertilizer arrived on, on the truck is much more targeted, it's much more defined than within a project so they're trained up and they've got a clear incentive. 
So many of the challenges that donors and development agencies have in Africa is monitoring the impact of what's going on in the field. And it's the same for business. You know, a business like Oland in Ghana will came to us and said, we want you to build an app. Because what happens is we give the farmers seeds, we give them fertilizer to go and grow something for us, and then at the end of the season, they promise to sell it to us, and we agree on that. They go into the field, they ask for the product, and the farmer says, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to do the weeding at the right time, or the rain didn't fall. Any number of excuses, right. whereas what they've done is they've taken the product and they've sold it on the open market because they yeah. think they can get a better price. Olam said, I want our field agent to walk into the field with an Android phone to walk up to that farmer and show, I asked you a question via SMS on this date, and then two weeks later, and then two weeks later, about whether you had weeded, whether you had applied the fertilizer, whether it had germinated, and you said, yes, 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 and there's no way that you don't have that product right now. So it's introducing that sort of transparency, and it's all about information flow. So you can send out lots of questions, but I think it's got to be to targeted audience that has got an incentive uh, to respond. All right. Um, so we want to take a final with that. Um, we work around 37 years. We work in five minutes.